Hello and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, we would love you to. You can do so at patreon.com forward slash the history network and you can become a patron for as little as a few cents per released episode. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network dot org podcast season thirty three episode ten King of the Few Adolf Sailor Malan. This episode was written by Clifford Thompson. Cliff is an award winning copywriter and creative director living in Canada. Born and raised in South Africa, he has always held a keen and deep interest in aviation and history, looking to develop film and documentary projects. These interests led him to discover more about some of South Africa's most famous World War II pilots like Marmaduke Patel, Dutch Hugo and Adolf Sailor Malan. Malan, in particular, piqued his interest this is an excerpt from his documentary outline about Adolf Sailor Malan, titled King of the Few. His research has led him in many directions, from a simple farmhouse in Kimberley to archives in the heart of South Africa and the United Kingdom. It has taken several years and includes first-hand interviews with veterans, friends and family of Malan. He grew up hearing about Manan, but never thought that one day he would hope to create a documentary of the man's life. On a clear day in 1960, a conversation took place between the pilot of a South African Airways passenger aircraft and Heathrow Airport's ground control. The pilot had a special request. He wanted to do a low-level circuit in London. In turn, the tower asked the reason for the special request. The pilot simply replied, I wish to show the sailor his London. Also seated in the cockpit was a man. His piercing blue eyes were overshadowed by the creeping symptoms of Parkinson's disease, his thin, stark body showed no signs of its former strong presence. Sailor Malan was nearing 53, the age at which he would die. In the last great war of the 20th century, a farm boy from the rugged bushland of South Africa took to the bloody skies of World War II Europe and made history, embraced as a saviour, a hero, one of the few by the embattled island of Britain and its king, yet considered a traitor by his own country. Born in 1910 in Wellington, South Africa, Group Captain Adolf Sailor Malan would fight three battles in his life. One would end with victory over Germany, another would end in defeat as he attempted to take on South Africa's apartheid government, the third would end in death, with Parkinson's disease stealing the remains of a once gallant and historic life. Hard on his men, hard on himself, Malan took on the mantle of a fighter pilot and all the aggression and determination it required. The man, once referred to as the greatest fighter pilot of all time, would be denied a military funeral by his own government and only be acknowledged for his greatness in 1991 after apartheid had been wiped from South Africa. Adolf Gisbert Malan left home at the age of 13 to become a sailor, but not before his young eyes had become accustomed to spotting game in the difficult overgrown Cape Velt while hunting. It was his keen eyesight that would later help him pick out an enemy fighter at ridiculous distances and in the tensest of situations. He would spend ten or so years at sea, join the Royal Naval Reserve and reach the rank of sub-lieutenant. 
While on a stopover in London, many of his friends had decided to enlist in the RAF. Malan followed suit. His keen eyesight and aggressive flying skills thrust him forward in all forms of air training, and he gradually gained a reputation. By this time, he had acquired a nickname, the Admiral. Acting pilot officer Malan was posted to 74 Squadron in 1936. It would be his one and only squadron to fly in combat until he became group captain and led many others. 74 Squadron, known as the Tigers, had produced some of the most famous aces of World War I, such as Mick Manock and Keith Coldwell. A year after joining 74 Squadron, Malan had become known by the nickname that would immortalise him, Sailor, an obvious reference to his days spent seafaring. He would spend the last year of peace leading a flight. A flight is a group of three planes at various contests and at the Bastille Day celebrations in France. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Three days later, Britain declared war on Germany and World War II had begun. 74 Squadron was immediately placed on alert. There are far too many events, experiences, battle skills and losses that occurred over the next five years to go through in this short period of time. Some, however, are important enough to give the measure of the man that Sailor was during this time. The Spitfires had arrived, and it was in this iconic machine that Malan would make his name. War for Malan began controversially and sadly with a little-known incident called the Battle of Barking Creek. On September 6, 1939, Malan's Spitfire flight was scrambled to intercept what was thought to be an enemy formation. Two pilots under Malan's command shot down two RAF hurricanes in a case of mistaken identity, killing one of the pilots. The pilots claimed Malan had given the order. Malan rejected this. It was the first friendly fire incident of the RAF air war. When the two pilots landed, they were arrested and a court-martial was instituted. Before the incident, one of them described Malan as being an older brother figure who he admired greatly and was quite close to, but this soured after Malan appeared for the prosecution. It was determined to be an accident of war and showed urgent need for a friend or foe, IFF, system and both pilots were returned to frontline service. 1940 was the year that elevated Sailor Malan to the status of hero. Practice, practice was his motto. Hard on his men and even harder on himself, he would not stand for failure. Malan did his own fair share of killing in 1940. His score would rise steadily. He would shoot down one of Germany's great aces, Werner Mulders. Mulders lived to fight another day. Malan would hone his flying skills and admonish his men to get in close and not press the tit trigger button before then. He re-sighted the guns on his Spitfire to converge at a closer range than what the RAF allowed. This meant you would have to be at a closer firing distance to the enemy to make sure you hit him. With battles raging up at 15,000 to 20,000 feet, Malan would throw his Spitfire around like a toy and in many cases follow his prey down to just a few feet off the ground. Malan saw action over Dunkirk as the British tried frantically to evacuate 300,000 men from the beaches. Day in and day out he would fly combat missions to destroy prowling German aircraft. It was on one of these that he shot down his first enemy plane. At 21,000 feet in a clear sky he yelled tally-ho and entered the history books. At first he overshot his enemy then followed the Ju-88 into a cloud far below. He closed in and opened fire. 
his incendiary bullet striking the enemy plane's fuselage. The rear gunner in the enemy aircraft stopped shooting at him and the plane went down. Malan would also share in the destruction of another enemy plane that day. His gun sight camera would capture many of his skills and the footage would be used in Allied propaganda films and shows us just how close Malan sometimes got to his target. Malan and 74 Squadron, in combat for only one week, flew constant, tiring and terrifying missions over Dunkirk. By the end, 74 Squadron had lost men, but they had shot down 16 German planes. In the process, Malan had been initiated into combat. In his own words, I'd tasted blood at last. The release from tension was terrific, the thrill enormous. I'd been wondering for so long, too long, how I'd react in my first show. Now I knew. Everything I had learnt had come right. There was hardly any time to feel scared. Malan was awarded a distinguished flying cross by the King for his action over Dunkirk. He was now an acting flight lieutenant. It was during the Battle of Britain that Malan would endear himself to the British people. Like so many others, he would cut loose in the skies above London and the English Channel, faced with inconceivable odds, and return each day to take the battle to the enemy. Malan would fly four or five sorties a day against waves of Luftwaffe bombers and fighters, crossing the Channel to bomb England into submission, and soften it up for Germany's invasion. Malan would help to change outdated RAF tactics that were as dangerous to his men as the enemy. He steadfastly and stubbornly challenged the RAF command when it came to these tactics, and the men above him would defer to Malan and others of his ilk. During one bomber raid in particular, the war got very personal for Malan. His son had just been born outside London. A German night bombing raid came over, and without thinking twice, he called his ground crew and demanded they ready his Spitfire for action. He got into his Spitfire, powered up its monstrous Merlin engine, and headed off in hot pursuit. Within twenty minutes, Malan shot down two bombers. He had climbed to 16,000 feet and used the searchlights from anti-aircraft batteries to help highlight the enemy. As his son once put it, The night I was born, Dad shot two planes out of the sky. He was awarded a bar to his DFC, yet another accolade. This would have been enough were it not for something that happened a few months later, also concerning Malan's son. With all that he had been through during the war, he once remarked that one of the scariest things he did was to ask Winston Churchill to be his son's godfather. Churchill readily agreed. In August 1940, at the height of the Battle of Britain, Malan became the commander of 74 Squadron. His coolness under fire showed when he saw one of his pilots get shot up by a German fighter he shouted for him not to bail out and pulled in close to escort the stricken plane back to the airfield. Young, new pilots were continuously being trained and many would be sent up with minimal time spent in a Spitfire. Malan commented that he could see when a pilot wasn't going to come back. He could sense that they weren't up to it but felt it would be more inconsiderate to ground the pilot than to let him go into combat. Malan had led since May 1940 and the strain was showing. He vehemently opposed being taken off flight duty and insisted on going up again and again to tackle the Germans. Time and again he would chase the planes around the sky, scoring kills, running out of ammunition, getting tagged by bullets from enemy 109s but he would always land and then return back into the fray. On the rare times his squadron wasn't in action, Malan was frustrated and anxious to get back to the fight. He returned from a sortie once and sat alone in one of the barracks. Tears streamed down his face as everything caught up with him. 
the terror of trying to kill another man who's trying to kill you, the weight of command, the solitary hours of boredom waiting for the enemy, the seconds of extreme fear when they arrived and a dogfight ensued, the comrades that never returned to fight another day, even he had to admit that he needed a rest. Malan likened air combat to entering a dark room with a madman waving a knife about. Coping with that fear wasn't something that came naturally to anyone. His individual combats during the battle are too numerous to mention, but by the time it ended in September 1940, he had more than played his part. Fighter Command then went on the offensive and took the air war to occupied Europe with probing and attacking formations of hundreds of planes. Malan would fly protection for these and chase down enemy fighters that threatened them. He repeatedly took part in these missions and would soon become the RAF's highest scoring ace. By the middle of 1941, Malan had become a squadron leader and then a wing leader and had added to his medal role the first fighter pilot to have won two DSOs and two DFCs. He had shot down 35 enemy aircraft and shared in others a total of 56 victories. The Belgians had given him the Croix de Guerre. He had been on active service and in combat as a leader for nearly 13 months. He had taken part in nearly all the offensive combat missions over Hitler's Europe since the end of the Battle of Britain. Malan was physically and mentally exhausted. He was also now a household name and had reluctantly given many interviews and broadcasts. He had tried to shun the limelight, but a thankful country hadn't allowed him to do so. Neither had his superiors. He even recorded messages and met the press from his own country, South Africa. It was then decided that Malan should go on a publicity and educational tour of the USA. America had not yet entered the war, and the RAF had a lot of combat experience to share. His fellow travellers got much pleasure out of introducing him to the Americans as Adolf. While on a tour to a US airbase, he insisted that he go up. The commander agreed to his request, but pointed out that there were already 12 US planes in the air on a training mission. Malan got into a P-39 Aero Cobra, took off and mock shot down all of the 12 in under 10 minutes. The gun camera footage from the Aero Cobra provided the proof of this incredible feat. In 1941, after four years with 74 Squadron, Sailor Malan left to become wing commander at Biggin Hill Fighter Station. It was from here that hundreds of planes were commanded and flew into combat. Malan was made commander of the base. It was a sad farewell. He had been through so much with his beloved Tigers. His command, however, didn't stop him from joining the missions flying into Europe. Malan would join up with wings from other airfields and head to battle. When the German fighters didn't come up to fight, he would taunt them by producing contrails in the sky with his spitfire, as if to say, here we are, what are you waiting for? He also had a free Polish squadron under his command, and when one of its pilots was shot down and taken prisoner, he received a letter from the pilot warning him that the Germans were keen to get their hands on the famous sailor. It was around this time Malan created his Ten Rules for Air Combat, a mantra that would be stuck up on the walls of fighter bases around England. Some of these rules are still in use today. Briefly, they are 1. Wait till you see the whites of his eyes. 2. Think of nothing else while shooting. Brace your body. 3. Keep a sharp lookout. 4. Height gives you the advantage. 5. Always turn and face the attack. 6. Make decisions promptly. Pull your finger out. 7. Never fly straight and level for longer than 30 seconds in the combat area. 8. When diving to attack, always leave part of the formation above for cover. 9. Initiative, aggression, air discipline, teamwork means something 
in air fighting, and 10, get in quickly, punch, get out. In January 1943, Malan became Group Captain Adolf Gisbert Sailor Malan, and now commanded an entire sector of England's fighter command. Almost as if they knew about his appointment, the Germans attacked Biggin Hill, the headquarters of Malan's 11th Group. He considered it a bloody nerve. As commander of a tactical wing, he would be in the sky on June the 6th, 1944, D-Day, the Allied invasion of Europe. By the end of the war, he was 35 years old. It was clear that an RAF desk job in peacetime Europe was not something Malan was looking forward to. Farewells were held and the Malan family prepared to head back to South Africa. But as one battle had ended, another was soon to begin and this time Malan would not be the victor. Malan was also famous in South Africa, but to many he was infamous. He was a returning South African war hero. The country had offered up thousands of its men to help the Allies in the war. Like many Commonwealth countries, the blood of South Africans had stained the grounds of North Africa, Italy, the Mediterranean and England. To some in South Africa, however, they were all traitors, and Sailor Malan was one of the biggest. He longed to return to the veldt that he had left all those years ago, so he bought a farm outside Kimberley and settled down. In the early hours of the morning he would visit the shed where the cows were being milked and the farm hands would talk with bravado about how they would have taken care of Hitler. In the chilly dim light of dawn a young farm hand, a child at the time, would recall how he sneaked into the shed and listened quietly as the men talked about the war. He would recall a poignant remark from Malan, I lived in the sky for 15 months. But the political instability still had one last hold on Malan. In 1951, the National Party, who instituted apartheid, tabled a bill that would remove mixed-race South Africans from the voters' role in South Africa. War veterans banded together to create an organisation to take on the government. They held marches and rallies carrying broomsticks with jam tins filled with paraffin and set alight. They became known as the Torch Commando, and who better to lead them than a great war hero like Sailor Malan? Malan led the Torch Commando for a few years, and although not a great orator, his quietly spoken, honest manner was effective in helping to swell the Torch Commando to over 200,000 members. Towards the end of the 1950s, something had begun to happen to Malan. His speech was slowly becoming slurred. Involuntary shakes would take over his body. Sailor Malan had Parkinson's disease. The neurosurgeon believed the stresses and intensity of warfare had something to do with undermining the health of Malan's nervous system. Over the next four years, Malan would rapidly worsen, and so it was on that South African Airways flight back from London, after joining a reunion with his fellow flying comrades, that Sailor Malan would look through the cockpit window at London, the towns and his long-remembered Biggin Hill for the last time. Sailor Malan died aged 53 in Kimberley on the 17th of September 1963 of pneumonia. Bitter to the end, the Nationalist Party government refused to give him a military funeral. His civil funeral, however, was attended by people from all over the world. Only in 1991, with apartheid wiped from South Africa's future, a portrait in his honour would be unveiled at South Africa House in London. At the height of the Battle of Britain, Winston Churchill would exclaim, Never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. On his death, the Times would simply declare, Malan, King of the Few. Well, thank you, Cliff, for writing that episode for us and all the best 
with the documentary King of the Few. If you would like to write an episode for us like Cliff, then drop us a line with your idea. Once again, if you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, please do so at patreon.com forward slash the History Network. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast. Written by Clifford Thompson. Read by Nick Barker. <laughs> <laughs>